The Etruscans were an enigmatic people whose origins are somewhat vague, although most scholars now agree they were descendants of the Iron Age Villanovan culture that inhabited the same area of the Italian peninsula. They spoke an unusual language that's still not fully understood and had a conflicted relationship with the ancient Romans for hundreds of years before being assimilated into their culture. Strangely, of all the monuments they left behind, there's very little that relates to their everyday domestic life. However, some of their necropolis did survive, and they were arranged like towns in a grid-like system. These huge cities of the dead have yielded some of the most interesting artifacts that the Etruscans left behind. Today, I'm talking about the Necropolis di Bandi Tatcha and the settlement it belonged to. I'm interested in the Etruscans for a few reasons. The most obvious one that you'll know from my previous videos is that the megalithic cyclopean or polygonal walls found in many hilltop towns of the Lazio region of Italy and a few other places have mysterious origins. They are thought to be Roman, but there are many arguments for them being older. Since the Etruscan culture is not fully understood, there's always the possibility that they built the walls. Legend has it that the Etruscan culture originated in the Eastern Mediterranean, but this isn't really supported by the archaeological record. However, the Aegean in the Eastern Mediterranean does have Cyclopean walls dating as far back as the Bronze Age, and as you will see in this video, some of the Etruscan tombs also have Cyclopean walls, albeit on a smaller and less megalithic scale. So although archaeology doesn't support a connection, it's tempting to speculate that there was one. Another reason why I'm interested in the Etruscans is that they appear to have spoken a non-Indo-European language isolate. I'm fascinated by undeciphered scripts and rare languages because without that information, our understanding of such cultures is little better than our understanding of prehistoric communities that left no written texts behind. A lot of what is known about the Etruscans comes from Roman writers who weren't that keen on them, to put it lightly, so it's not possible to get a non-biased written record of their culture. I also think it's crazy that the Etruscans were expert diviners and during more peaceful relations with ancient Rome were encouraged to continue their craft. It seems that the careful interpretation of the will of the deities via animal entrails was something of a speciality that only the Etruscans could do well. Caera is the Latin name for the Etruscan city around 50 kilometers north of Rome. The Etruscans called it Cicera. The Greeks are Gila and the Phoenicians history. The modern town is known as Cerveteri and is a lot smaller than the ancient Etruscan city is thought to have been. Although not its nearest seaside area, the port town called Pergi, modern Santa Severa, eventually became important to Carrere for trade. Pergi needs a whole video itself, but just a couple of things worth mentioning are the Pergi tablets and the fortification walls. Dating to 500 BC, the Pergi tablets are gold plates containing Phoenician and Etruscan texts dedicated to the foundation of a temple to the Phoenician goddess Astarte and her Etruscan equivalent Uni. These tablets have been helpful in understanding the Etruscan language and those, together with other evidence, show that Pergi was an important sanctuary as well as a trading port. The medieval castle of Santa Severa really stands out because it used the remains of Cyclopean fortification walls in its construction. So this is another example of a Cyclopean walls association with Rome being rather tenuous. Also, as I've mentioned before, a local Italian legend attributes the walls in general to an ancient Greek culture called the Pelasgians. And interestingly, a temple at Pergi is also given the same origin. But anyway, this video is not part of my Cyclopean Wall series. So back to Carrere. Commercially, Carrere's economy was largely driven by iron ore mines in the nearby Tolfa Hills. The modern-day Cerveteri is 80 metres above sea level and would probably have been the site 
of the town's Acropolis in Etruscan times. Unfortunately, there were almost no remains of Etruscan buildings or structures in the main town. There are a few sections of a fortification wall made up of rectangular blocks of tuff still remaining, a wall that is thought to have had eight gateways and which wasn't Cyclopean. You see why I need to include this region in my next video on the walls. It's really hard to find a consistent pattern when analysing them. Anyway, the remains of two temples and a theatre have also been excavated from Civitari. I visited the archaeology museum which houses many of the Etruscan finds from the area and is located in the remains of a medieval castle that is the most prominent historic building still standing. Two of the most prominent Etruscan necropolis in the region of Viterbo, which together are a UNESCO World Heritage Site, are those of Banditaccia and Tarquinia. I visited Banditaccia a few months ago, on the same day I visited the Archaeology Museum in Civitere. They're about half an hour walk apart. What's absolutely incredible is that it covers almost 1,000 acres, and only 25 acres are open to the public, but that's still an impressive amount of space. In fact, the complex hasn't been excavated in its entirety yet. Here's the plan of the area that's open to the public. Alongside the tree-lined avenue leading up to the visitor centre, I could see hundreds of the more conspicuous type of Etruscan tomb, the stone and earthen mound, or tumulus. They stretch four kilometres. There are around 1,000 tombs in total. Here I've marked with dots some of the more obvious mounds beyond the visitor area, which I've circled in red. The necropolis was in use for hundreds of years, from the 9th to the 3rd centuries BCE. There are several different types of tomb which vary in size and they are all well planned and laid out in a grid-like system. Overall, the impression I got when I walked through there was a monumental city of the dead. The circular tombs are made from volcanic tuff topped with earthen mounds. Their insides are carved out of the rock. Some are highly carved, others more plain. The most elaborate ones are painted with frescoes or decorated with detailed reliefs which give us insights into the everyday life of the Etruscans. Although no domestic dwellings from the period have survived, experts think that the carvings within the tombs such as architraves and ceiling beams were meant to imitate the houses of the living. A similar conclusion has been reached about the much older Neolithic tombs in Sardinia, known as the Domus de Janus. The tomb of the reliefs is highly decorated with stucco reliefs and belonged to a family called Matuna. Unfortunately, it wasn't open when I visited the necropolis. Its reliefs include Cerberus from ancient Greek mythology, the three-headed dog that guards the entrance to the underworld, a demon with a fish tail, a serpent, many objects from everyday life such as crockery, items showing the family's occupation as magistrates, as well as helmets and weaponry. Another fascinating tomb is called the Regalini Galassi tomb, which dates to between 650 and 600 BCE and would have belonged to a wealthy local Etruscan family. It contained bronze cauldrons, gold jewellery, silverware and a chariot. Look at the detailing on this gold bracelet, it's stunning. Many of the finds are in what's known as the Oriental style. This style appeared during what's referred to as the Orientalizing period, a time in the 8th century BCE when Greek art started to take on Near Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean influences. Although not Greek, the Etruscan civilization went through a similar transformation during the same time. One of the most famous sculptures to be discovered at Banditaccia is this statue of a couple atop a sarcophagus, now referred to as the Sarcophagus of the Spouses. It's housed in the Etruscan Museum at the Villa Giulia in Rome. Made of terracotta in an anthropoid design, the sarcophagus was once painted. A similar one was found in the same necropolis and is housed in the Louvre. According to this diagram in the visitor centre, the earliest visible tombs at the site are the circular tumuli dating from the 7th to the 6th centuries BCE, with the square-shaped ones made of rectangular blocks beginning construction around the 6th century BCE. 
Prior to the tumuli, simple shaft tombs were cut into the rock and held cremations. This is thought to have marked the later period of the Iron Age Villanovan culture before it transitioned into what became known as the Etruscan civilization. Here are a few examples of the Cyclopean architecture that appears in patches on some of the tombs. It's strange that it wasn't used throughout. I can't find any information on why some of the tombs were built from square-shaped tuff, others from what seems to be concrete, others from the bedrock itself, and then others with patches of polygonal masonry. As I mentioned in my most recent video on the mysterious cart ruts, I also found a few examples at Bandy Thatcher. Well, they look like cart ruts to me anyway. Overall, the whole necropolis is not only impressive, but gives a sense of holding some major secrets to the ancient past. At the time it was built, there was an increasing amount of connectivity between different parts of the Mediterranean, as well as the Near East. So it's to be expected that the Etruscan monuments, art and rituals would be, to a certain extent, syncretic. However, the Etruscan civilization seems to have emerged from its Iron Age antecessor, fully formed and sophisticated. It seems to have had numerous influences from other regions quite early on in its development. And it seems to have had its own unique skills and traditions as well. Further work is needed, but I'm becoming very attached to reading up on the Etruscans. So more videos about them will follow. If you enjoyed my video, please hit the like button, subscribe if you don't already. Thank you to my patrons. If anyone else wants to join my Patreon community, the link is in the description below. Come and find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where I post megaliths and other ancient history content regularly. I've also got a website with some further information on the sites I visit and the articles I write for magazines, megalithhunter.com.